NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Hey everyone, it's hard to believe, but it's October already, and I'm looking outside at the changing leaves and feeling the the dropping temperatures, so it seems like the great time for the right time, another episode of the National Writing Project. I'm super excited, too, to unite the Louisville Writing Project once again with this National Writing Project initiative. As a lover of story and art, I'm especially thrilled to premiere our first children's book to the show. I look forward to everything that's about to come. Tanya, how are things in California? Are you going surfing today? Is it still warm there? <laughs> First of all, Brian, though people do, I don't think anyone should surf in Northern California. It's scary as heck. <laughs> um, uh, but it is warm and sunny and the air quality is pretty good. So we're feeling very excited in California in October. There's a lot of sort of late summer in October in San Francisco. It's a month that it's actually warm here. so. We're great, and like you, I'm so excited to for our interview today. Cheryl is a great friend and colleague from the Louisville Writing Project. Kay Fi and I were colleagues at the Writing Project for a little while, and we love her work and are so excited to see it out in the world. And we are getting to meet Jacob Kramer, and we this is gonna be a fantastic interview featuring Brian for the first time on The Right Time, a children's book, an illustrated children's book. So here we go. So Jacob Kramer grew up in Providence, Rhode Island and studied filmmaking and writing at Harvard. Like Noodlefint, he loves hunting for mushrooms, eating noodles and organizing with friends in pursuit of justice. And Kay Fai is an author illustrator who grew up in a house built in the 1700s with a printing press her father bought from a magician. She illustrated Occupy Tale, the sequel to Noodlefint and wrote it and illustrated A Normal Pig. She's the 2019 James Marshall Fellow at the University of Connecticut, a Brown Handler Writer in Residence at the San Francisco Public Library, and the 2018 Ezra Jack Keats Berlin Memorial Fellow at the University of Minnesota. Born in Charleston, Massachusetts, Kay is currently living in Switzerland. And it's also an honor to introduce a colleague from the Louisville Writing Project, Cheryl Block, who currently serves as a coordinator of professional learning within the Louisville Writing Project. Her teaching began in special education, and then she moved to fourth grade, where she found the writing workshop to meet the needs of all students. She continues to provide professional learning and writing instruction throughout the state of Kentucky and is active with the Louisville Writing Project as a fellow. Through this work, Cheryl has connected with the National Writing Project and works to carry on the mission to develop the writer in each teacher and student through the College Career Community Writing Program and Kid Writing. It's a pleasure to have them on the show. Indeed it is. Cheryl. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Doing great. Excellent. Glad to be here. We're going to hand the show over to Cheryl, k Fi, and uh, Jacob. We welcome you to the right time. So it's all yours, Cheryl. Well, we have an exciting book to introduce to you. And as writers, we always stop and take some time to think and write before we dive into our reading. So I invite you at this time to um, consider this writing prompt. Think about people you work with, whether in school or in a work situation. What responsibilities do you have to them? Responsibilities to each other. It's a great question. Well, we wish you the best with the interview. We're going to pop off and we'll be back in a little while. Have a good time. Okay. Well, uh, I do welcome uh, Jacob. It's the first time I've met you and k I know you from uh, the uh, book, A Normal Pig. And I was able to uh, hear you speak during the Kid Writing Conference. Now, a theme of the National Writing Project this year is writing to and for your people. And we kind of use that to encourage people to think about when you write, who are your people? Who do you write to? And who do you write for? Either of you. Well, I guess I can, I'll get started. I'm Jacob. I am the author of these books that I made with KFI. They're published by Enchanted Lion Books. Um, And in terms of sort of thinking of an audience, um, 
I like to think about, I mean, in my family growing up, there was this uh, constant refrain, not necessarily coming from me, maybe more from my sister of, it's not fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I find as an adult, that refrain has become uh, more of a, a presence in my life, um, seeing how things transpire and just feeling like it's not fair. Um, so I think of that kid who's trying to deal with these questions of what is fair, what is just, what should we do, who's in charge, why can't, why are things the way they are, um, and that's that that's sort of who I write for. Yeah, when I, I think about that question, your book. Mm -hmm. no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say when I think about that question, it's it's a that's a hard question, you know, it's um. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated question because I think it's different for everything that I write, right? Um, in some ways, and I think about someone like Maury Sendak, who famously said that he hated children. He didn't write for children, um, and I don't think that was totally true, right? <laughs> like, like he clearly enjoyed the presence of children. He, you know, he was so good at what he did. But um, I do think that there's something about writing for kids when you are kind of putting on the act of writing for kids. And then there's a way of writing that I think is writing for um, where you're writing and it happens to be for a children's audience, but it really respects the intelligence of the reader and it respects what the reader might be capable of understanding. Um, and I think that that is, I didn't really realize that until we started bringing these books into the classroom and, and until I started doing school visits with the normal pig and we went on book tour with Noodlefind and I got to see firsthand how kindergartners were able to take this story and understand it and be able to, you know, they like Jacob said, they have this very deep sense of what is just and what is not just. Um, so I think that in terms of like who we're writing for, at first I was like, I'm writing for people who are like me, who think like me. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe we're writing more for like kids who just have questions about the world. You yeah. know, that's really important. Jacob, you wanna add on to that? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I also, I write in different modes as well, as does K-5. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's clearly different, different audiences for different things. I've got a book about telescopes, which is coming out next year. So um, doesn't Is really, it informational? It's, yeah, it's sort of informational and playful and, you know, about exploring the universe using telescopes. You know, I, I notice in both of your uh, books um, that, that you use animals as your characters. I'm interested uh, why you selected animals and how you would go about selecting which animal for which character. That's a great question. Um, yeah. Wait, hold on. Do you want to take this one, Jacob? We talk <laughs> about animal allegory a lot. So yes, Yeah, these are for both. Yeah, well, we both work in this mode. Um, and well, so first of all, animal allegory is like one of the most ancient forms of storytelling. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like every culture all around the world, people have fables and myths that involve animals as sort of stand-ins for human counterparts or actually just as kind of more uh, like animals with extra intellectual capacity. Um, and I think that, I think what, is great about using animals is kids love them and they respond mm -hmm. to them. And they, so you connect with a kid who's two years old using one of these books um, because they love elephants. <laughs> um, so it's a way to bring an audience in in a very welcoming way. Um, and I think also it's just, it's a very good way of just um, showing difference without necessarily pinning it to any particular human difference. And a lot of the issues that come up that can result in conflict or need to be resolved often have to do with different kinds of human difference. And so it's it's just a way of offering kind of a, a stand-in for that that is metaphorical. And then you can use to apply to lots of different lessons once you start talking about the book. Okay, yeah, I, I don't wanna add to oh, it. Yeah. Sorry, sure. I'm too excited right now. I'm gonna try to calm down a little bit. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do think that like that being said, when you work in animal allegory, you have to be really careful because these characters are basically stand-ins, they're walking, talking animals that also have very human attributes. So you just have to be, you know, very selective when you're using a character and 
selecting an animal that you want to represent your protagonist or your antagonist. Like you, there has to be a reason why. And it's also just more fun to add in the actual, them being actual animals also and like adding in that element. But um, like, for example, um, I just, I, I've been thinking a lot about Richard Scarry. Um, Richard Scarry actually lived in the town that I, I live in right now in Lausanne. Really? Yeah, and he made, you know, busy town. And sure. But if you look closely at his books, um, all the animals who are in positions of power are animals like lions and mm -hmm. bears, foxes, like animals that are like associated with intelligence. And all of the workers in the town are like pigs and mice. And they're, you know, like, what does it mean when you call someone a pig versus you call them, you know, a fox or something like that? So I think that it's like we want to be, want it to be really intentional with Noodle Fan and Copy Tail with selecting animals that, first of all, aren't you don't really see in picture books because it's more fun to have like a fly as a as a as a main character, or and um, I guess elephants are you know you see some elephants, but I didn't want the story to have. Um, you know, lions and cats and dogs necessarily. Um, we just thought it would be more interesting to have more variety and have it be multi-species. Yeah. Jacob, you have a page you want to share? Yeah, well, I, um, so basically in this this book, O Copy Tail, um, it's about a conflict between a community of animals and this O Copy who comes to town who's an O Copy Tillist. Um, so that's- <laughs> sort of like That was pretty good. <laughs> You know, sometimes it just lands on the animal based on some kind of pun like that. Um, but I wanted to also share with you that, you know, like even within the context of these books, there is like a little bit of that. Um, like we play a little bit with this, the ideas around mm -hmm. animal stereotypes. Um, for instance, like the, the mice in this scene, um, they sing this wonderful song. Yeah. That the, um, the machine is for everyone and it should be public. Uh, we built this machine together. It's for everybody to use. Whether you're scaly or hairy or feathered, there's noodles for me and for you. And it, it goes on. Um, but then the, the Okapi goes to talk to the mayor, who's this kangaroo, and he says, I'd like to buy your old machine. It's dented and clutters up the park. Besides, it's attracting all kinds of vermin. Um, <laughs> and so he refers to these extremely cute little mice mm -hmm. as vermin in mm -hmm. this very demeaning way. And, um, you know, that's like, it's, it's using these, um, using animals opens up, you know, I guess like different opportunities for sort of showing this bad forms of human behavior in a slightly like, would you say like lower stakes environment? Maybe? Or it's like slightly more removed. Like when the Okapi yells at the workers cause they're working slowly, it's like, um, he calls them sloths, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's done in this very insulting way, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, really, I mean, it's obviously in the human world, people use animal epithets about people in a horrible, demeaning, dehumanizing way. Um, and- I know when I read the story, uh, I was taken with the animals, your selection of the animals, and it opened up. Uh, because the animals are characters, it opened up me to really think about the ideas that that were happening. Now I don't know K five if you do this intentionally, but I pay close attention to the animals' faces and the expressions. Is, is that purposeful for you in your illustrations? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that is uh, that's something I've really. I, I try to focus on a lot and I think about um, the books that I illustrate as kind of like a play or a film or an opera or something like that. And when I was in high school and middle school, I did a lot of theater. And something that I loved was and like kind of like the most fun part of having like a bit part in a play was to be in the background and to have to mimic like what life was like for the people who are in the background. Cause that's just playing, right? It's just playtime. And I think when I'm really getting into drawing these background characters, you can kind of inhabit their emotional world by deciding like, well, I'm, cause I'm drawing the visual narrative, like what is going on in the scene um, that has nothing to do with the main thing that's happening. Like what might those characters be thinking about? What might their lives, what might be happening in their lives? So it's like Jacob, tell, like when I get the manuscript, you know, it's like three pages of just text, but then, 
I have to come up with this world that it all lives in. And that's a lot of generative writing also in a way, right? right. It sure is. So Jacob, when you write your stories, and I'm thinking about your process as a writer, um, what, what do you start off with? The main message, the characters? How do you come up with, with your uh, main idea or the uh, main part that you want to communicate? Um, I, I think that the way that I start is typically with whatever idea, whatever is, you know, going around in my head that I can't stop thinking about. Um, in the case of of this book, O Copy Tale, at the time that I was writing it, I was involved in a lot of neighborhood organizing in uh, Somerville, where I was living, around this, um, basically a big parcel of land had been sold in a no bid contract to a big out of town developer. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this, you know, sort of classic case of sort of a sweetheart deal behind the scenes with the mayor for mm -hmm. um, in, in something that would not necessarily benefit the people who already live in this community and also probably would lead to a lot of displacement and misery. Um, and so I was organizing with friends and neighbors around this to try to get something out of it. Um, for the, the neighborhood. And it really made me think about like, you know, how does this happen? Like, how did we get to where we are? You know, like what, what is going on around us all the time that, that this cycle is perpetuated um, where public things, your public goods are constantly being privatized or things that really should belong to everyone um, cost a lot of money. Um, so then I just decided that it would be interesting to try to expand on the world of Noodlefint and take on this question. But I, I mean, I also think that, you know, on the other side, ideas come from these little bits of wordplay, like Okapi, Okapi to list, or like yeah. my nephew invented the idea of this elephant who loves noodles. Um, so there's, there's lots of things sort of kind of bouncing around, I'd say. That's awesome. K5, when, when you enter into, you read that text, how do you begin uh, the illustrative oh. process? Um, well, I have a sketchbook here that I can cool. you. Cool. <laughs> I mean, for the people who are, um, for the people who are just uh, listening in, I mean, it's a, it's a sketchbook. It looks like a mess, basically, but it's basically, um, just like lots of drawings. And I try to keep this on me all the time. It's a little different now during shelter in place because I'm not right. Like, traveling, right? And that's kind of the joy of the sketchbook is that I kind of treat it like a phone in some ways. Like when I'm bored in a place, I try to take this out. Um, but I can show you, I have, a, I use post-its a lot. And I'll use post-its to kind of think about like, well, what does it, what do I want the spread to look like? Or what do I want the scene to look like? Or how do I kind of break this manuscript up into chunks? Because each page, you know, only has a few sentences on it at the most. So like, how can I think about the rhythm of the story where um, there's a lot of opportunity for surprise as you turn the page? And as I'm thinking about that too, um, it's interesting, the way that Jacob and I work together uh, is different, I would say, than the way that I have worked with other authors in the past, where if I think that I can illustrate something that doesn't need to be in the text because it would just be redundant, um, I'll let him know. I'm like, I don't think we need this sentence here because you're going to see it. And if you mm -hmm. see it and then you read it, it kind of doesn't make sense to do it twice. So I'm always trying to think of, and this is a very subtle difference, I think, when you're illustrating a text, you have like the text, which would be like, you know, um, we, we did a drawing game recently that was like, everyone thought that the new farm was a great idea or something like that. But then how do you illustrate that in a way that kind of tells a different angle in the story instead of just drawing everyone thinking that the farm was a great idea. Maybe you'll have one character that clearly does not think that the farm is a great idea. <laughs> or maybe you see something visually that kind of subverts the text. So I'm always looking for chances to just play with that and really have fun um, when I get the manuscript. How do you all communicate and give feedback to each other. And how does that work? You as an illustrator, Jacob as a writer, do you collaborate or do you 
just let someone just go off and then come back and look at it and make revisions then? I mean, I think that's the way we do it. It's like, Jacob will send me a draft of the manuscript. I will look at it and we have like, you know, protocols that are, um, and we've built a lot of trust with each other. I'm like, here's what I want. Here's the feedback mm -hmm. that I'm looking for. Um, and you know, you have like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm extremely sensitive and moody. I, I <laughs> need to be handled very carefully. Jacob knows that, right? So I think just being aware of each other and trying to be as respectful as possible. I mean, there's certainly a lot of things I've learned from NWP with like, I mean, even like the consultancy protocol of like, I'm just gonna let you talk and tell me what you observed or what you noticed in this text versus you just jumping in and telling me how you think it could make it better. And it's, you know, it's all trust building, right? But sure. generally how it works is Jacob sends me a manuscript. I'll make some doodles in the margins and I'll let him know I'm like, this seems like it's going somewhere. I think I know what the character is going to look like. Here's some feedback I have on like the story. And then he'll go back and rework that. And then he'll send me back a more finished version. And then I'll start to turn those into those post-its, those thumbnails. But it's not like we're sitting over each other's shoulders saying like, make that sentence shorter or like make that thing blue or something like that. Cause I think that that would just become a little too, um, a little too much, right? So that's so powerful because it communicates respect between workers um, and, and developers and artists that you are. So uh, when I think about this book, it is a children's book, but I also see where it can be used in a secondary setting uh, to introduce the concept of capitalism, the concept of ownership, the concept of what is right for the people who live in the community. What, what do you feel about uh, this text being used outside of a, a children's type uh, setting? I would love that. Um, we presented we presented Noodlefint um, to students. I think they were like, some of them were even high school age. Um, we certainly did assemblies with, with middle schoolers and stuff. Um, and I think that, yeah, the concepts in this one, um, you know, ranging, yeah, from privatization um, to sort of industrial action, mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole pollution, system, yeah, yeah. Pollution, mm -hmm. um, sort of democratization in a broader sense, away from just just thinking about elections every two to four years, versus democracy in the workplace or democracy about um, you know how things are allocated or ownership of different useful things. Uh, those are all topics that are great to talk about with um, people of pretty much any age. <laughs> um, and I think one one thing that I really have loved doing, we did like a online book tour last year. Uh, not last year, mm -hmm. last week, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. we, we what year are we in? <laughs> um, we have this moment in the middle of the book that I can read from um, where Noodlefent is sort of in a transitional moment and she's dreaming about like all the possibilities. Yes. Um, and she says, uh, she's on this boat. She's like going, she was on a trip and she's returning home. So she's seen more of the world. And she says, the more I see, the more I think about how we can change our ways to share in common all the things that help us live throughout our days. Food and water, medicines, hot tubs, energy and trains, housing in the wilderness, factories for making things. Orchards, farms, and neighborhoods are not for the wealthy few. They should be held as public goods. They all belong to me and you. You. And so we had this very nice moment in some of these read alouds where we actually put a poll to the uh, participants to say like, what do you think should be free for everyone and owned publicly? And we got some, you know, nice responses where, where students were able to take a moment and imagine, you know, what, what might be different if we did things differently. I mean, I think it brings up a lot of really good questions too about things like, like what if public transit was actually free? Like, and what is preventing us from having public transit in cities, right? Um, I think one of my goals with the book or something that I'm hoping for in classrooms is to have the book more like present questions more than anything else. And I think we did that with Noodlefint a lot. It's like, how might, the world look different. And I think obviously that appeals to, 
you know, secondary school <laughs> students a lot, you know, who, um, who have a lot of questions about the way that things are, or who also, you know, are, they've been um, in this kind of like culture of compliance, right, in schools for 13 years, 12 years, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> well, and truly educate students to become keepers of their world. Uh, the National Writing Project uh, has college career community writing program. And uh, one of the last drafts that students do is a civic argument. And I see this book as being so valuable of addressing those issues in their community, something close to them that they think can change or uh, might be possible to change. It amazes me working with students how sometimes they they don't realize they have this ability to use their voice to make something better. So my next question for you is after reading the book, and I think you've kind of addressed this already, but what type of an impact do you want it to have on the younger child, on the older child, or even the adult who reads it? What would you want people to do after reading this book? Well, you, what's funny is that, so we wrote this book obviously before the pandemic hit, especially wow. the pandemic completely changed our lives in the US. And I think sharing it now um, in this time where a lot of people can't rely on the support of the government to help, to get help and are really relying on other people and their communities and mutual aid funds and like just like community support, like food banks and things like that. Um, I think about, uh, you know, how, how might this book just like kind of support that thinking and like how do we take care of each other and I'm even the prompt the writing prompt at the beginning of the show um how do we support each other how do we um what do we owe each other I was thinking about this joke I forgot where I saw this joke it's this fantastic joke that's like um two hikers are in the woods and they see a hungry tiger appear in front of them and one of the hikers puts on her running shoes <clears throat> the other hiker says to her hey, you know, you can't outrun a tiger. And then she says back to the other hiker, like, all I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel like is just such an amazing symbol of um, kind of the world that we all found ourselves in in the US, you know, especially in this past year. Um, mm -hmm. It's not about living in a society where we all kind of take care of each other. It's just sort of like, I'm in it for myself and I got mine and you know, in that, you know, it's a pretty messed up world to live in. <laughs> Obviously, it's not the world that I want to live in. And I think that, um, especially with kids and, you know, the conversations we have in classrooms, it's just such a hopeful and optimistic thing for me to go in and talk to students and be like, how do you feel about this? And have them, you know, say like, well, here's how I feel about it, right? Right. Jacob, you want to add to that, Annie? I think, I think our um, hosts and hostess are back with us. Thank you all so much. I've learned so much from you all. I would, I mean, I would add to that that um, to sort of recognize that in both of these books, um, individual action is quite limited and it is very much focused on collective action. So for people to understand that if, if they are to change anything, it's going to have to be in concert with the people that they, that they trust and they agree with um, because there's, clearly a lot that needs to change but it's not going to happen on your own I like the song awesome message <laughs> the song and democracies for me and you it gets repeated and i and it's it's the national writing project's write out month and um i started thinking this morning because it's an environmental writing thing with the national parks and i was thinking about an economy and ecology both begin with the eco which is home and too often through nationalism we define our homes by separating and not uniting uh, like a global citizenship and and i've been really thinking about that a lot like if we have ecological literacy how do we include not only the local but the international as well which i'm not so sure is um always on the radar of american educators and definitely politicians but anyway wonderful to hear all this cheryl do you have a, a prompt to kick i do this you know what after all this discussion now i want people to think back to your initial thought about what you wrote about responsibility that we have to each other. After hearing about um, the Opaki tale, have you discovered any new information? 
Has your thought about responsibility changed any? I invite you to write to that and rediscover what's really important. That's awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. You bet. Yes, sorry, I got behind on my screen. <laughs> Brian, do you have any final thoughts today? Um, I just, the illustrations are amazing. And amazing. And the, the storytelling is wonderful. I agree that this is definitely K-16. I think you can introduce this in a lot of ways. Um, and I now have just gone on Amazon to order Noodlefint, although I should go to my local bookstore to support them to order these books rather than go through a large corporation. <laughs> you can also request it from your library. Yes, we should get them. We should, all of us who are teachers, we should request our libraries to order both of these books tomorrow no today if the libraries are open <laughs> <laughs> uh jacob and k Fi, it was really lovely to have the opportunity to hear you talk about your work cheryl i really appreciate that the questions especially the questions about uh both individual and collaborative processes um I feel a need to put in a plug myself in case you two are looking for a new project. Uh, you know, sometimes people choose a minor character and tell their story. And I'm in love with that purple octopus who <laughs> appears in both stories. So if he has a, he or she has a backstory that might need to be told, I'd be all on top of that book right away. Just saying. Uh, I want to uh, really say thank you to all of you. I so appreciate this conversation today and I want to thank our listeners. If you are new to the National Writing Project, you know you do not want to miss conversations like these. So please visit us at nwp.org to sign up for our newsletter where you can find out about such exciting events. Follow us on Facebook. If you're an educator who wants to talk to other educators about reading and writing and teaching those things, uh, join our Facebook community. There's a lot of great conversations happening there. Uh, follow us on Twitter or Instagram also. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Tanya, thanks, NWP Jacob and Kay Fine and Cheryl. A production of the National Writing Project. NWP. WWE Radio.